Thank you so much, Max, for this uh, introduction and for the opportunity to speak on this series. I did indeed have the great pleasure to uh, visit uh, Metrics uh, for some time earlier this year. Today I'm going to talk about clinical trials reporting at Nordic Medical Universities and University Hospitals. And uh, uh, I am happy as well to preface this by saying that this work has been done uh, mainly by a very talented postdoc, uh, namely uh, Catherine Axfors. Uh, those of you who have followed this series uh, know uh, Catherine uh, well because she has been the coordinator and moderator uh, for quite some time of this seminar series. I'm also very happy to see many of our other project collaborators uh, among the uh, participants today. So, reporting of clinical trials uh, is uh, necessary uh, to give us a solid evidence base for uh, decision making in clinical practice. Uh, this figure shows uh, a stylized meta analysis. Uh, one in one case, where all the studies are present, uh, and so uh, the result is unbiased. In the other case, some of the results are missing. In particular, the negative results have not been reported, and this leads to an exaggeration of uh, the estimated effect. So, uh, when we try to find out which clinical interventions to use, we uh, usually do try to synthesize uh, the available evidence, and uh, when we don't have uh, all the trials, we get less precision. And when the trials are systematically missing, we get bias. And then it may appear that treatments are effective, even if they are ineffective or indeed harmful. So that is one reason why the reporting of clinical trials is necessary, in, to provide us with reliable and useful evidence for clinical practice. It is also an ethical obligation we have an obligation towards our research participants uh, to uh, get as much knowledge as we can out of their participation. Uh, this is clear and codified, for example, in the Declaration of Helsinki. There is also a statement by the World Health Organization which recommends that cl clinical trial results should be reported within 12 months at the latest in the registry where the trial was registered and within 24 months uh, at the latest in a full uh, publication. In the European Union, which is uh, where I'm sitting at the moment, uh, there is also a, a directive uh, that uh, gives us a legal requirement to report trial results uh, for pharmaceutical uh, trials in the European Union Clinical Trials Registry. However, uh, there have been follow-up studies uh, before that have shown that many trials are not reported. And here is an example from the Into Value project. Uh, in Germany, we are collaborating with this group and uh, Daniel Strech, who leads this research team, is uh, here today, very nice. Uh, and so this figure shows uh, results from their follow-up stratified by year. Uh, and as you can see, uh, many studies uh, never published results during the whole follow-up period. Uh, uh, close to a half uh, remained unpublished by 24 months. Uh, and so there is a great scope for improvement. Uh, there was also some signs here that uh, perhaps there is a certain improvement uh, from year to year uh, in these data. Although that's uh, 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 not, uh, not exactly an effect that hits you between the eyes, it might still be there. So, uh, we have done something very similar in the Nordic countries to follow up the reporting of clinical trials. Uh, and we have included trials that were registered in the European Union Clinical Trials Registry or at clinicaltrials.gov and which were completed in 2016 to 2019, meaning that they had to be marked in the registry as having been completed. Uh, that means that there may still be a considerable number of trials that are uh, actually completed, but that we haven't found because they're not marked as completed. Uh, we further limited ourselves to trials where the sponsor is a university with a medical faculty or a university hospital. 
uh, for some different reasons, for consistency with the earlier projects, because these are major sponsors, and also because these are major uh, stakeholders that we can uh, hopefully rely on to help improve uh, things. The main outcomes that we have looked at are the proportion of studies reporting results and the time to reporting. And there is a protocol. Uh, you can uh, have these slides later and follow the link if you wish to find it. We were able to get uh, data for the uh, trials in the European registry from uh, the European uh, Union Clinical Trials Tracker that I think many of you may be aware of. Uh, which has been developed at the University of Oxford by Ben Goldrich's group and Nick DeVito in particular. They are maintaining an excellent database which we uh, happily could use. For clinicaltrials.gov, we were able to download uh, the whole uh, set of trials uh, directly from them. Now, it is uh, fairly easy to see uh, when results are published in the registry. What is difficult is to find out whether results have been published anywhere else in the literature. And this step required a lot of manual searching. And uh, we do have a very large team of collaborators to whom we are indebted for uh, their uh, participation in this. So a lot of manual searches were performed. Uh, first, we checked the registry website to see if there were any linked publications in the registration. Uh, we also made a Google search with the trial identifier uh, as well as Google searches with combinations of terms uh, from the registry, title, investigator, name, and so on. Um, and I believe this method gives a fairly good coverage. Of course, we will not have found everything, but I do believe we have found uh, the vast majority of things that, that we possibly could find. Now, here is the sample of trials. Uh, the inclusion criteria we had uh, gave rise to a, a total uh, sample of 2,113 trials. About half of them were from Denmark, uh, about a quarter from Sweden, uh, and uh, uh, as you can see then, Norway, Finland and Iceland in descending order. About a third of the trials were trials of medicinal products, and the remainder were not Here I've put up two examples of studies in our sample, and this is not to single anyone out, uh, but just to show that uh, there were different kinds of studies included. Uh, we have here one example of a trial that was uh, designed apparently uh, to uh, inform clinical practice in a fairly direct way. Minimal access versus open spine surgery in patients with metastatic spinal cord compression, a one center randomized controlled trial. This is perhaps what we think of uh, the kind of research design that springs to mind when we talk about clinical trials. But we also have studies uh, that look like this one, where there is a uh, graphical abstract, altered brown fat thermoregulation and enhanced cold-induced thermogenesis in young, healthy, winter-swimming men, a study that included healthy winter swimmers and healthy controls, and looked at the differences in... Uh, um, uh, temperature production and activation of brown uh, fat when these people were cooled. So this is not uh, a study that is directly intended uh, to be used for any kind of clinical decision making. Um, is that even a clinical trial, the second example? Well, we may keep in mind here that uh, the WHO has a very broad definition of what are clinical trials uh, for the purposes of registration. Uh, they define it as any research study that prospectively assigns human participants or groups of human to health-related interventions to evaluate the effects of, on health outcomes. It has been debated whether this uh, definition is too broad. Uh, for the present purposes, I would argue that studies on humans should be reported in a timely way, whether or not they are intended uh, primarily to uh, guide clinical decision-making. Uh, anyway, I wanted to uh, make a point of, of this uh, so that uh, we have an idea of which kinds of studies we're talking about uh, going forward. Now here are the main results. Uh, stratified by year, and uh, we are indebted here also to the InterValue project uh, for 
building on their uh, code base. Now, I would like to draw your attention to uh, some different features of this graph. First of all, uh, the curves don't start at 100%. Uh, why is that? So if you have conducted a clinical trial and it ends on a certain day, uh, presumably uh, you are not going to finish the analyses and deposit the results uh, on that same day. Uh, most likely, what has happened here is that some of the trialists uh, have conducted the analyses and then they report the trial as completed at the same time as uploading the analyses. And this, uh, I have tentatively called this updating bias uh, for updating the uh, registration. Perhaps there are epidemiologists here who have a better term for this. In that case, please let me know later. Uh, so this lag, uh, anyway, contributes to a, a more optimistic picture uh, of the time to reporting. The second thing I'd like to draw your attention to is the proportion of trials that never report any results during the whole follow-up period. In this case, it's 22% uh, of trials that don't report any results during the entire follow-up period. We can also look at the proportion reporting results at 12 months, which, uh, if you recall, is the target set by the WHO for results reporting in a registry, and 24 months at the target for reporting results in a publication. And so here we have just under 50% of trials uh, still unpublished at two years, and a bit under 75% at one year. Um, this is marginally better than the data from the InterValue project that I showed some minutes ago. But it's very far from where we would like to be. And as a reminder, what we would like to see uh, in an ide ideal world is something that looks more like this. Uh, so uh, starting out at 100% and then reaching 0% by year one. And the gap here is uh, uh, quite large. Uh, four secondary outcomes. If you look at the unreported trials, uh, they had a median planned sample size of 42, but ranging up to over 15,000. Uh, for a total planned size of about 83,000 people. Uh, that's a high number. To me, it's a, a mind-boggling scale of uh, research waste, uh, I have to say, that these results are unreported. About 60% of the trials were prospectively registered, so registered before the start of data collection. Uh, that also suggests a, a considerable scope of improvement uh, because retrospective registration, although it uh, is helpful, it doesn't meet many of the purposes for which prospective registration uh, exists. Uh, and it also introduces the possibility of a bias where the studies that were retrospectively registered were perhaps those where the researchers were more interested in their results uh, or uh, so. We could also find that looking at the trials registered at clinicaltrials.gov uh, that were likely to have been required to be registered in the EU clinical trials registry, uh, less than two thirds could be found uh, in there again suggesting a scope for improvement. Here is a graph showing the proportion of results uh, reported uh, by country. At the top we have summary results within one year. Uh, this is close to zero, whereas the graph I showed before uh, was not, and that's because summary results here means that any results were available in the registries uh, themselves, uh, and not uh, inclusively in the registries and in any publications. Uh, the next panel is any results within two years, and the last panel is any results during the whole follow-up period. It appears that uh, the studies from Denmark are uh, have a marginally higher proportion uh, reported compared to the other Nordic countries. The results I have showed you are, in a sense, the, the most positive uh, 
headline numbers that we can think of. And this quite complicated visual metaphor here is uh, supposed to illustrate that we can think of the whole process as a, a kind of um, uh, conveyor belt where we have studies moving from a planning phase through registration, then they are executed. Uh, uh, after that, some of them are marked as having been completed in the registries and some of those are and then reported. So we have attrition at every step. Not all of the studies uh, that uh, are made are registered in the first place. Not all of those studies that are registered are then marked as completed. And then, as we have showed, not all of those uh, results end up uh, in the registry or in another publication. But at the same time, we also have studies that are becoming registered uh, after they have been executed or after they have been completed. Uh, therefore, uh, I think it's safe to say that uh, our approach gives a, um, a higher proportion of reported studies than you would get uh, if it had been possible to take into account this attrition, uh, which of course is, uh, uh, well, more or less by definition unknown uh, to us. Where do we go from here? Uh, we want to make open comparisons between sponsors, so to put up a, a list of who is doing better and who is doing worse, uh, because this may be likely to spur uh, actions uh, for uh, institutions to try to improve their position on the list. I want to continue this work and extend the follow-up to look at more years, uh, more sponsors, more registries, and also other types of research. Uh, of course, uh, clinical trials are very important, but it's also important to report other kinds of research, like animal experiments, uh, for example. We are also uh, starting to do some more meta-science work on uh, this cohort of trials uh, to investigate the transparency of reporting. Uh, and uh, I'm also interested in looking more closely at the reproducibility and accuracy of reporting, such as did the researchers report the outcomes that they had said they were going to investigate or have they switched outcomes uh, without declaring it? Importantly, uh, we also want to join efforts with others. Uh, and uh, I'm hoping that we can merge uh, both data sets uh, and uh, work together on research questions with those other teams uh, that have been doing similar follow-up uh, studies uh, in other places including the United States, uh, Germany, uh, Poland, uh, uh, the team uh, at uh, Oxford, and uh, possibly others. Uh, here is a screenshot of uh, the Shiny app that the German team has put up that enables comparison between the German uh, university medical centers. Uh, and uh, here again, I would like to build on their excellent work and put up a similar uh, thing for the Nordic sponsors. Um, lastly, and perhaps most importantly, um, we are seeking to cooperate with the various institutional stakeholders uh, in the Nordic countries. And we have already reached out uh, to a number uh, of them and talked to them before the results were in. This uh, includes uh, universities and uh, hospitals, uh, as well as research funders, the Swedish Research Council, uh, and uh, health technology assessment uh, organizations, uh, and others. There is a, a responsibility uh, together uh, to improve things. And uh, uh, I uh, always try to uh, uh, position ourselves as um, uh, not uh, not standing outside uh, the door and complaining, as it were, but rather being a part uh, of uh, an academic research system where we all need to work together uh, to do better. It's very important that we do not single out any individual investigators, uh, but rather we seek to emphasize uh, the institutional responsibility. I believe that researchers should not be left alone uh, with the responsibility of reporting their clinical trials. We are all faced with different uh, challenges, such as uh, grants running out, um, changing positions, uh, retiring, 
uh, things happening outside of our control. I believe that it is necessary for our universities to take a stronger responsibility uh, for supporting researchers doing clinical trials, uh, both when it comes to registration uh, and uh, follow-up uh, to make sure that the results come in in a timely way. Uh, and so we will now uh, go forward and seek uh, contacts again uh, with these uh, different stakeholders and hopefully um, our data will help uh, to facilitate their work and uh, perhaps we can have some role in coordinating uh, uh, interactions as well by different stakeholders to try to improve uh, clinical trials reporting. Lastly, I want to thank the whole team, uh, in particular uh, Catherine, but also everyone else who has been involved in uh, different ways in this project, contributing expertise, uh, coding and other things. And uh, here is um, uh, the whole list of collaborators, uh, many of whom again I'm happy to see here today. So uh, thank you very much. <laughs>